Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'm going to present part nine of my lecture series on pathology of cattle, and today we're going to talk about the musculoskeletal system. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who have provided me images throughout the years which allow me to put these lectures together. Here's a case of Tetra Amelia in a Holstein calf. Uh, Hemimelia or Amelia or Tetra Amelia are often recessively inherited lethal defects and it's been identified in Holsteins and Galloway cattle. And usually you have to uh, examine the pedigree data and see if this has popped up over time to identify a genetic problem. Um, sometimes these animals are just thrown spontaneously. In humans, the WNT3 gene causes uh, uh, hemimelia, and probably something is similar, although there may be environmental factors that also affect the expression of this type of gene. Here is a case of hemimelia, um, two very short. This animal sort of reminds me of a, a dinosaur. Uh, maybe the only predatory cow ever known, um, but this is a case of hemimelia in cattle. Well, people want to be able to raise cattle on very small farms, and so some of these boutique cattle like the Dexter breed, as seen here, um, have become fairly popular. However, when you breed for short stature cattle with short legs, you are going to be breeding in a number of issues. And the Dexter cow is as well known for the Dexter bulldog calf as for anything else. Bulldogs have quite a range of problems, including a foreshortened mandible and maxilla, and the tongue always protrudes because it's just a lot long enough to, uh, to contain it. They also have foreshortened twisted limbs. They are usually stillborn. Uh, occasionally they may be born alive, but they don't last very long. Here is another uh, animal which resembles a Dexter. There are a couple of different types of, uh, of these calves. Um, this one didn't look like it was aborted, um, so this might be a snorter or a telemark. And once again, we have the short twisted legs, we have the dome forehead, we have the uh, very short mandible maxilla and the protruding, protruding tongue. These animals, obviously if you name an animal a snorter, uh, you're going to have some significant problems with breathing. A lot of these animals will die of suffocation shortly after birth. When we look at these short twisted legs, there's actually very little growth because there is a concomitant defect in endochondral ossification and these growth plates are quite deformed. They are mushroom shaped and uh, just not a whole lot of potential for these calves after birth, if they do survive birth. Here is a snorter calf. This one uh, obviously has fairly low penetrance of this gene, but you can see that the, uh, the maxilla um, is shorter than it should be. The mandible may or may not be a, uh, a normal length, and there are some problems in limbs. Here's a, a dwarf calf, and, and you can see from front on that the abdomen is greatly dilated. Um, chronic bloat is a characteristic of dwarf beef cattle, and there's never been a very good explanation, but uh, uh, my old friend John King had noticed that uh, there were a pair of bones that were often extremely prominent in the uh, inside the cranium of these cattle. And he called them dwarf bones or bloat bones. They're actually the uh, inward projection of the wings of the orbito orbitosphenoid bone. Got to get that one right. And uh, you can see this in a wide variety of beef cattle, Angus Herefords, 
um, and some milk breeds, such as the Channel Island breeds. And uh, I don't know if they actually cause this, but if you've ever hear somebody use the term bloat bones or dwarf bones, um, just remember that this is what it refers to. Okay, here's a nice picture from Dr. Kim Newkirk of the University of Tennessee, and this is a case of arthrogryposis. There is a bending, an abnormal twisting of the hind legs. Often, all four legs will be involved, and there are a wide range of causes of arthrogryposis. But the common denominator is that the animal is not able to extend or move the legs in utero and for a various number of reasons. The most common cause of arthrocarposis around the world is probably in utero viral infection of the developing brain and spinal cord. Remember that muscles need innervation to grow properly. And if a virus like a bunya virus or pestivirus gets in and damages a spinal cord, that innervation will not develop and the animal will not develop muscles, it cannot move it, and these, uh, these limbs will get stuck in one position and you'll end up with arthrogryposis. That's the majority of cases. There are a couple of plants that will result in crooked calf syndrome, another name for this. Um, lupins is a very interesting one um, because a particular compound in the lupin and a gyrin results in, in somewhat of a sedative or anesthetic effect. And so the animal is sort of there in a, you know, a, a sedated form. It doesn't move those legs and they end up uh, getting bent into an, and locked eventually during development into an abnormal position. Uh, another interesting one is ponderosa pine, which causes uh, persistent contraction of the uterine muscles. And so the uterus is always contracted and the animal does not have the ability to stretch out and move these developing limbs. Uh, along a similar line, um, if the animal doesn't have enough room to maneuver because the mother has uh, hydramnios or hydroallantois, um, you can also get uh, cases of arthrogryposis. So um, there's a wide range of causes, but the common denominator, once again, is the animal is unable to move those legs um, during gestation and development. There is a genetic form of arthrogryposis, uh, which is seen in Angus cattle, known as arthrogryposis multiplex, or curly calf syndrome, and it's well known to, uh, uh, to the breeders of Angus cattle and uh, these animals have severe contraction of the limb joints as well. And this is something that has been largely eradicated from most lines due to selective breeding. And this is a mild case. Um, not only the limbs are affected, you can also see uh, uh, various degrees of kyphosis or scoliosis and rib abnormalities, especially with the congenital forms of arthrogryposis. One of the conditions that may be associated with arthrocarposis is pallidoschisis. We saw this previously uh, in the, uh, one of the early lectures on the uh, initial parts of the oral cavity and pallidoschisis may be a spontaneous defect resulting in a, a, a delayed or absent uh, fusion of the uh, lateral ridges of the hard and soft palate. Uh, as we said before, this can also be seen as part of a syndrome. Uh, Charlotte cattle have a syndrome of arthrogryposis and pallidoschisis. And this is the result of a defect in the localization of acetylcholinesterase in the end plates uh, regions of the muscle. So they don't develop properly and the developing limbs end up fused in an abnormal position. And there sure are a lot of congenital defects in, uh, in calves, and when they pop up in the musculoskeletal system, they're usually fairly obvious. This is a, uh, a classic uh, fetal monster known as 
schistosoma reflexus. It's a uh, heritable uh, and obviously fatal disorder, disorder in calves, which results in spinal inversion. And this puts the uh, uh, hind limbs adjacent to the skull. There's also usually exposure of the abdominal vi uh, viscera due to a fissure in the ventral abdominal wall. And these limbs are not only in the wrong spot, turned upside down, but they are also fused into uh, abnormal positions. So there's ankylosis of the joints. Uh, you generally have pulmonary hypoplasia and diaphragmatic hypoplasia or, or totally absent. But uh, all of these schistosomal reflexes pretty much look like this. The, the legs are turned upside down, put in uh, abnormal ways, and there is eventration of the abdominal viscera. Another classic, generally acquired congenital defect in uh, ruminants occurs due to the ingestion of a plant known as false hellebore or veratrum californicum during certain very particular windows during gestation. If ingested between days 12 and 16, it causes very characteristic uh, abnormalities uh, in the developing calf. Um, this is the time when the, uh, when the neural tube is splitting into two equal halves uh, through the activity of the sonic hedgehog uh, gene and the other homeobox genes, which, which give uh, most of the body its symmetry. And the, uh, the toxic principles associated with veratrum, including cyclopamine, cyclopacine, and gervine, affect um, this cleavage. And so if you look at the developing brain, it has one large lobe known as holoprosencephaly. And the eyes are also fused. They do not split into two, and they are present in a single orbit, giving rise to the name a cyclops, but cyclops is probably an inappropriate term here because as you can see right here, there are two fused eyes and synophthalmus is a much better term for the uh, external appearance of this eye. Um, you can see that the animal has severe craniofacial abnormalities including uh, marked brachynathism um, both the mandible and maxilla are greatly foreshortened. The animal does not actually have the, uh, um, the olfactory part of its brain, so the nose does not develop. If it does, there is sort of a rudimentary proboscis that often comes out of the forehead. So this is what happens if you ingest veratrum californicum at days uh, uh, 12 to 16. There are a couple of other syndromes associated with that. Day uh, 28, the animals will develop fine in terms of, uh, of the head, but they will be chondrodysplastic dwarfs because the toxic principles selectively inhibit the growth of the metacarpal and metatarsal bones. Here's another classic fetal monster. Um, this is a amorphous globosis. And what we're looking at is a, uh, a, a bit of a haired twin with an umbilical cord. You may have some primitive heart and lungs and a bone or two inside, but it obviously does not develop properly. And usually you will find amorphous globosis born, if born is the proper term for something like this, born to twin to a healthy, perfectly healthy calf. Here is syndactyly, partial or complete fusion of functional digits, mostly seen in Holsteins. There is a particular type of uh, swine called a mule foot swine, which uh, only has one toe. There, its congenital syndactyly is characteristic of that breed, but uh, most cattle should have, uh, have four phalanges and two large claws. Here's polydactyly. We have an extra claw here. Usually when you see these defects, they're more frequently seen in the forelimbs for some reason. Well, here's a really good case of syndactyly.
Okay, we're looking at the, uh, the cross-section of a long bone of a stillborn calf. And you can see that there's absolutely no marrow space. The ends of the bone are marked by these two prominent pyramids of unremodeled bone. And this is a condition known as osteopetrosis. We see it in mammals and we see it in birds. It's very different in birds. Um, it's also seen in horses. Remember that bone remodeling is primarily driven by osteoclastic resorption of the primary spongiosa. And in cases of osteopetrosis, there is a genetic abnormality in the SLC4A2, I call it the slick 4 a 2 uh, gene in affected cattle. And this particular gene results in the ability of the osteoclast ruffled border to become acidified. And actually, that's what it uses to resorb mineralized osteoid and in the absence of this no osteo osteoid is mineralized I mean no osteoid is resorbed and these elongated uh, uh, tongues of mineralized osteoid just progress down into the diaphysis it's most commonly seen in red Angus cattle and it's not just the long bones that are affected. You also will see uh, brachynatia inferior or a very shortened mandible, a protruding tongue, and the teeth in both the maxilla and mandible are unable to erupt because um, the bone is not thin enough to the, for them to erupt. So these animals will usually, usually be anodontic. Whereas you might think that these bones are, will be extremely strong, it's not remodeled. It doesn't. Um, it does not handle stress very well. It's basically just mineralized cartilage, so they fracture extremely easy. You'll see shortening of the vertebra, and uh, the bones of the skull are extremely thick. So you may, on top of everything else, see cerebellar herniation. There's just not enough room for the growing brain and hypoplasia of the optic nerves because they sort of get cut off by a, a ridge of bone. Osteopetrosis in birds, uh, very, in very short terms, is a result of viral infection of osteoclasts. We see something very similar. A viral infection osteoclasts in developing calves may be seen with bovine viral diarrhea. So you thought you were going to get through an entire system without talking about BVD, um, but you can't because you can see uh, um, in the bones of animals with, uh, with bovine pestivirus, you can see segmental lines of sclerosis, um, which go horizontally from cortex to cortex as a result of a transitory viral induced uh, depletion of osteoclasts. And then, then the, if the animal survives, then the osteoclast will come back um, and will, uh, the animal will continue to grow properly. Wow, will these congenital defects ever end? Well, there certainly are a lot of them. Um, these are uh, enlarged cranial fontanelles in a calf, and this calf had uh, hydrocephalus, known as a neuropathic hydrocephalus, and this is a uh, congenital problem in Angus cattle, which has been largely eradicated as a result of selected breeding. Uh, finally, something that's not a congenital problem, and uh, this is a case of probably secondary to uh, osteochondrosis. We have a large flap that has ripped off of the uh, top of the humerus. I'm uh, sorry, the bottom of the humerus. And uh, not an uncommon place for osteochondrosis in cattle. And we're looking at the long-term arthritic effects, osteophyte production, uh, ebernation and cyst formation within the uh, underlying bone. Arthritis is probably very common in older 
um, cattle, but for that they often get just sent to slaughter and not a lot of people will take a look at it. But it's a very common problem and it can cause real problems in the expensive breeding bulls due to conformation issues. When we talk about osteochondrosis, uh, I do want to simplify a lot of stuff. And it's, it's very complex and there are a lot of excellent papers out there. But uh, I tend to think about osteochondrosis as a, a problem in vascularity of the developing joint cartilage. And it generally arises whether we're talking about cattle or horses or pigs or dogs as a result of um, our desire for rapid growth for very large animals, for heavily muscled cattle or whatever. And the, uh, what happens is the, the joints are designed to grow a certain way. And when we put weight on them an abnormal, from abnormal directions, as the animal grows too fast, um, is pushed too hard, is conditioned too much, and we put on muscle, it changes the different pressures on the joint. And in the cartilage, what that will do is it will collapse the blood vessels that supply nutrients. And we will get little areas of ischemia and ischemic necrosis. And that starts off sort of a, a vicious cycle of uh, articular um, joint degeneration. When you kill off cartilage, the chondrocytes tend to release a lot of agents which cause necrosis of the surrounding cartilage. It sort of has a, a, uh, a death wish to start with. So any injury to uh, articular cartilage can eventually result in significant defects. So that's my explanation of osteochondrosis, putting pressure in abnormal ways on the developing joint. So here is, uh, uh, we're looking at a stifle joint of a heifer, and this is very early on. You can see that there are a number of defects. There's not the tremendous osteophyte proliferation, so we don't have a lot of arthritis yet, but we have a number of defects within the, uh, uh, the articular cartilage arising from osteochondrosis. Okay. Bacterial infections of the, uh, uh, of the bones are certainly seen in cattle as well as in horses. We tend to think about uh, suppurative osteomyelitis or suppurative physitis in, uh, in foals. Um, and it is seen in calves too, also at a very high rate. But the difference between um, suppurative osteomyelitis or epiphysitis in calves is that it tends to be latent for a much longer period of time. And normally you'll see it very quickly in foals. It may be latent for anywhere from six months or more in calves. So oftentimes the calves are a bit older before they manifest with the lameness and the joint swelling that you see in, uh, uh, in calves. Some of the, uh, uh, the common bacteria have, have receptors for bone surface proteins, like Staph aureus will do that. And when this infection start, really gets going, um, the local inflammation will be replete with uh, certain cytokines like tumor necrosis factor, which actually activates bone resorption from osteoclasts, resulting in some very significant defects. Um, the infections are probably caused by common environmental uh, pathogens such as staph or strep or all the coliforms, but because these are somewhat latent and, and uh, long-standing infections, you may be able to, uh, uh, to culture something like Truparella out of it, which is a common long-term contaminant of uh, abscesses caused by other organisms. Salmonella is also a common uh, isolate here, probably the most common in animals under three months of age, whereas animals over six months of age, you're going to get Truparella. A 
just a higher magnification showing the uh, that the infection is centered on the growth plate you know in in horses and cattle when we get uh, an infection from the, or usually rising from the uh, infected umbilicus joints are very commonly affected probably the most common site to find uh, additional areas of infection remember in addition to uh, uh, certain certain bacteria having receptors for for various proteins that are found in bone the developing growth plate has uh, um, has these vessels that go up into the cartilage canals and make a very sharp turn and if that's not enough for bacteria to get caught oftentimes within the growth plate those vessels are fenestrated to feed the uh, developing cartilage so it's a great place for bacteria to get caught and to get out of the bloodstream and into the surrounding tissues Okay, here's a condition that's seen in cattle, occasionally seen in pigs and cats, and you will see discoloration of the bones. A, it will be this sort of rich brown color. The condition is, is known as congenital erythropoietic porphyria. Uh, it's seen in Herefords and Holsteins and Ayrshire's in cattle, and it's a, a deficiency of uroporphyrinogen 3 cosynthetase and we've talked about this in terms of photosensitization it is the cause of type 2 photosensitization because these animals have high levels of uh, porphyrins and protoporphyrins which are cir circulating in the bloodstream and they get into the bone and cause a pigmentary discoloration and it's a discoloration only because if you section this particular bone um, you're not going to see anything abnormal histologically um, the ends of this bone are white um, there is a variation in penetrance of this particular gene so lesser affected animals it tends to concentrate in the diaphysis and in more affected animals you will see the entire bone will be discolored the uh, because of the secretion of these porphyrins and uroporphyrinogen uh, one in the urine the urine will be reddish brown or it will turn red on exposure to sunlight. These animals may also have a mild hemolytic anemia in association with the photosensitization. Interestingly, they do not have discoloration of the teeth as we can see in cats with a very similar condition. and just an older picture of the discoloration associated with congenital erythropoietic porphyria. You do not have discoloration of the teeth, but um, there is deposition of pigment within the teeth, and when you put uh, either the uh, bones or the teeth under UV light, they will fluoresce. This is sort of part of the photodynamic nature of porphyrins and the causative factor for these animals to develop photosensitization. Okay, moving on to the joints. Remember that when you are necropsying calves, especially with infected umbilicus, you need to, and really any calf or any foal, you should open up seven joints a minimum of seven joints pick your joints some are easier to get to than others um, but if you do seven and you do not come up with evidence of uh, bacterial infection that is probably a pretty good sign anything left than seven you probably haven't done a very complete job um, and this is what you are going to see in young animals with early stages of uh, bacterial sepsis and we've talked about this many times before one of the classic signs of bacterial sepsis is the presence of fibrin within potential spaces that could be the thorax meninges abdomen or especially the joints 
Um, this does not mean that the animal has concurrent suppurative osteomyelitis. You need to section that bone as well. But you do have damage to the uh, uh, vasculature within the joint uh, and probably endotoxic damage and exudation of plasma protein through the and between the damaged endothelial cells. So this one is pretty good. You can pick this up pretty well. Here's another one. I would think about, of course, uh, the coliforms at this stage of the game. But staph or strep would be a pretty good one too. Here's another one. All three of these have been, uh, been the result of E. coli infection. And a nice large area of fibrin directly within the joint. This one might be a little bit more long-standing. We may be getting some fibrous connective tissue which is starting to be deposited. And this one is a frank fibrinopurulent arthritis, long-standing. And uh, when you culture this, you may start to see other things. Streptococcus, arcanobacterium, if you wait too long. And uh, one of the other things that we need to think about, which uh, is a common cause of arthritis in uh, slightly older calves, is mycoplasma, mycoplasma bovis. And this is a, a chronic fibrinosuppurative arthritis from which mycoplasma bovis was cultured. So don't sleep on mycoplasma bovis as a result of uh, suppurative arthritis. As a general rule in any species, one affected joint, probably traumatically implanted. Okay, animal had an injury, poked itself on a nail, something like that. Um, if you see one joint, open up as many of the other ones as you can. If you have multiple affected joints, then you're probably dealing with a systemic bacterial infection. This is often what you'll see in the calves. You'll see these multiple large hot joints. The animals are, are not willing to move. They're not eating well. And uh, this would be a nice case of bacterial synovitis. Most of the uh, coliforms want to enter through the uh, through an infected navel. Uh, mycoplasma tends to enter in circulation from the lungs. Here's another case of mycoplasma synovitis. Mycoplasma is very interesting. Um, spread widely within feedlots, and about 15% of the animals in feedlots are probably going to show some evidence of synovitis. Some recover, some, some develop chronic arthritis. Um, mycoplasma is something that we'll see in a number of the lectures because uh, it tends to affect a number of different organ systems. Uh, you can see it in the middle ear. Mycoplasma are often concentrated in areas of the body where there are cilia. Um, it is a cell wall deficient bacterium which wants nothing more out of life than to become a cilium and so it tends to go to the airways, tends to go to the uh, inner ear through the middle ear um, and you can see it in the reproductive tract. There aren't any cilia in joints. Um, actually every, every epithelial cell in the body has one big cilium but uh, it it's not enough usually to attract mycoplasma, so, so, but it does, does end up in the joints. A lot of calves end up with mycoplasma because um, it's in the milk. When the milk is rejected um, for selling for human products, a lot of times the farmers, and never really understood this, will take this milk and they'll feed it to the calves and it's contaminated, has high levels of, of something in it, but they think it's okay for the calves, it's sort of natural. And if the, animal, if the milk is contaminated with mycoplasma, because the animal has mycoplasma mastitis, um, the animals that drink it often will develop uh, uh, middle ear infections, which sort of starts the whole process. So um, that is the story of mycoplasma in calves. Another bacterial infection that we looked at earlier, um, worth a reprise. Um, this is the, uh, I think this picture is actually an upside down, but this is the maxilla of a, a cow, could be the mandible as well. And we see a 
really marked proliferative and granulomatous, these yellow areas, areas of granulomatous inflammation within the jaws of cattle. This is actinomyces bovis or lumpy jaw. And when you get these uh, great specimens and you boil them out, you can see the tremendous, not only proliferation, but the lytic nature of this, uh, this granulomatous infection, actinomyces bovis, and a very similar bacterium, actinobacillus lignorisi, which both are commensals in the mouth. Actinobil and both of them are uh, sort of inoculated into the tissue and set up a chronic, chronic granulomatous inflammation. Actinomyces bovis goes for bone. Actinobacillus lignorisi goes for uh, soft tissues, especially the tongue and the uh, uh, draining lymphatics and lymph nodes in the oral cavity. Here's a case of vert separative vertebral osteomyelitis and a pathologic fracture. And this is another one of those salmonella infections. Um, salmonella was cultured out of this by Dr. Pam Kelly in Dublin. And it's one of those long-standing infections. Um, and the animal probably was uh, septic very early on in life and it got into the vertebra and it just was a chronic smoldering infections for months to maybe even a year. If it's salmonella and it is outside the GI tract, it's probably one of your host adapted ones which cause sepsis, so salmonella Dublin would be a pretty good guess. If you had cultured actinomyces, excuse me, Truparella pyogenes out of this, um, that wouldn't be untoward because, as we said before, long-standing abscesses often get taken over by Truparella. Okay, here's an absolutely great lesion in the metacarpal bones. It's a little bit yellow. It's an old museum specimen. Um, but what we're looking at is we're looking at severe proliferation of the periosteum, severe periosteal new bone growth. It's sort of a poorly formed chalky bone, and this is what is seen in fluorosis. And we've talked about fluorosis before. Fl fluoride, the fluoride iron, mimics calcium very well. Has a this similar divalent charges, and when it is taken into the body, it will exchange itself for calcium within the hydroxyapatite crystal of the bone. But it's not really as strong as calcium, and so the bone that is formed with phosphate incorporated in it um, is very white and chalky and weak, and the body will try to uh, will try to stabilize it by putting down a lot of other periosteal new bone, which is actually no better. Um, these changes are primarily seen um, in the metacarpals and metatarsals. You'll also see changes in the teeth as well because the uh, odontoblasts will incorporate and the ameloblasts will both incorporate uh, fluoride in the developing enamel, which cracks off, and you can also see uh, dentina dentinal abnormalities as well. The, uh, the incorporation most obviously will affect the bones at the site of active formation. The lesions are much worse in growing animals. Um, you don't make a lot of enamel later on life after uh, three years, so you're not going to see many, uh, many of the dental changes in, uh, in older animals. There are cases in which uh, um, you can have acute toxicosis. These animals will develop uh, a tetany and hyperesthesia because fluoride tends to replace a percentage of the uh, calcium within the, uh, within the blood. So, but most of the lesions are associated with uh, the incorporation of fluoride into, uh, into the bone and teeth and are chronic lesions. A real problem in uh, uh, veal calves is rickets. 
Um, rickets is the condition that's associated with animals with uh, who are growing with open physes. Um, osteomalacia is the term uh, that is used for the deficiency of calcium and the weak bones associated with adult animals. One of the prerequisites um, for developing bone and proper endochondral ossification is the mineralization of the osteoid. Um, if the osteoid within the growth plates is not mineralized, osteoclasts will have absolutely no interest in it. They only will nibble on uh, mineralized osteoid. So animals that do not have uh, proper calcium levels will not mineralize their osteoid. And of course one of the factors that is required for a conversion of uh, vitamin D to 125-dihydrocholecalciferol is activation by ultraviolet light. So here is a cross-section through one of those ribs and you can see that the growth plate is markedly enlarged. It is irregular in nature and this is what we expect to see with rickets. The differential should not include vitamin C deficiency because cattle are one of the species um, which does have the enzyme galonolactone oxidase and has the ability to manufacture its own vitamin C. These animals should have enough calcium in the diet, but without activated vitamin D, which regulates absorption. So there will be decreased absorption, decreased calcium, and the body will mobilize uh, calcium from the already developed parts of the bone and will not be able to expend it on, uh, on other things, such as mineralizing the growth plate in order to uh, sustain the life of the animal. Okay, very common lesion in animals that are starving, um, heavily parasitized, and this is serous atrophy of fat. Also look at the, um, as, as a general rule, look at the entire body and look in ruminants. A great place to see great serous atrophy is also around the uh, the base of the heart around the coronary vessels and you'll see sort of a gelatinous dissolution of the fat there but uh, probably about 90 percent of the bone marrow is fat at any given time so it's a great concentration and you will see this sort of liquefied gelatinous, gelatinous uh, marrow some people call this starvation marrow Absolutely one of my favorite lesions um, in all of veterinary pathology are the beautiful patterns that you see with lymphoma, usually seen in calves infected with uh, bovine leukemia virus. And, and what we see here is a combination of infiltration of neoplastic cells as well as infarction of areas of the bone marrow giving us these beautiful sort of mosaic appearances and nothing else looks like bone lymphoma especially in a calf they're absolutely beautiful another classic bone lymphoma this one's also underneath the periosteum as well in this rib osteosarcomas uh, cattle probably get them like everyone else. We just don't see them because they're probably a tumor that's most often seen in older animals. And uh, animals that lame tend to go to slaughter. Very few of them will uh, get obviously to this point where the entire diaphysis and metaphysis are filled with tumor. You know, as long as the tumor whether we're talking about a cow or a dog. As long as the tumor remains confined within the diaphysis, it doesn't go anywhere. All of your metastatic foci and all that are usually arise from extra cortical parts of the tumor.
Okay, winding up the skeletal system at least, this is a large tumor in the front of a uh, an ox's jaw. When I see tumors in the front, usually they fall into two categories. This one is ameloblastic fibroma, and cattle do get them on a fairly regular basis. So that would be one. And it looks like we have some small tooth-looking structures in here, which is associated with that. The other thing that you might see in the area of the mandibular symphysis are ossifying fibromas. You can see those in both large and small ruminants as well. Um, this particular uh, tumor used to be called an adamantinoma. Not quite sure why. Okay, moving on to the muscular system, to the muscles of cattle. A great picture from Dr. Ginny Pierce from the Frederick Animal Diagnostic Lab. We're obviously looking at uh, one of the large muscle groups in the front of this uh, ox and when in size this uh, whole uh, area uh, probably smelled like rancid butter. You can see that there are large areas of necrosis and hemorrhage and especially right here we can see that there is gas production form formation of emphysema and those findings put together point to black leg. which is caused by Clostridium shelvii in cattle. We've talked about uh, black leg before and the fact that the, the cattle are not uh, sterile animals. They have prepositioned bacteria, especially Clostridia, um, throughout the body, usually in macrophages, and they're just waiting for the right environmental conditions, which for them is hypoxia or ischemia to begin to proliferate and to cause vascular and muscle damage. Um, don't confuse Clostridium shovii or black leg with the other Clostridia, which are also in there, which, uh, which cause a condition known as pseudo black leg. And that would be Clostridium cerdeli or Clostridium septicum or even Clostridium uh, perfringens. But those generally will proliferate after death. They're not an anti-mortem. Their pseudo black leg is much more of a post-mortem type of lesion. Uh, so this is black leg most often seen in the large muscle groups of the forelimbs, uh, the hind limbs, especially the areas of the haunch, and you can also see it occasionally in uh, the muscles of the tongue or deglutition in young animals or cardiac muscles as well. Greenish discoloration of the muscles is often the result of eosinophilic myositis um, or the inflammatory condition which results from the rupture and uh, inflammation associated with sarcocystis. Sarcocystis bovicanus um, is a common one. You've very commonly seen sarcocysts in muscles, and as long as they stay within the muscle fibers, it's absolutely, absolutely not a problem, but when a number of them will rupture at once, they do result in eosinophilic inflammation. And when you get eosinophils together in large numbers, you get a greenish discoloration of tissue, and nobody wants to buy green meat at the grocery store. Here's another more mild case of eosinophilic myositis due to uh, uh, sarcocystis infection, sarcocystis cruzi, sarcocystis uh, bovihominis, bovicanus probably all have the ability to cause this type of, of likely hypersensitivity reaction and damage to the muscles. This is sort of yellowish green, but look how dry and walled off it is. This is an injection site. Why well, a lot of people will put injections in the neck or in the muscles of the back anywhere but in the expensive cuts of meat. Nobody's going to buy that one at Food Lion. Okay, we're looking at uh, some larval cestodes within the muscle of the mandible. You can also see this in the heart. This is Cystocircus bovis. It is a larval stage of the human tapeworm Tinea saginata. 
Um, once they get loose uh, uh, in the bloodstream, they tend to hone in on the very active muscles and uh, cattle not being athletes, the things that are always going are the heart muscle and the, uh, the muscles of the jaws. So uh, they tend to be overrepresented in cases of Cystocircus bovis or measly beef. They usually don't cause any problems in affected cattle. Um, and usually affected humans get one tapeworm which can live for many years. Oh, here's an absolutely great picture of a genetic problem in adult cattle resulting from a defect in production of uh, a protein known as myostatin. Myostatin causes a cessation of growth in affected muscles. So the condition is known as double muscling, often seen in uh, a Belgian blue cattle. And although you think that uh, this would be sort of a prize thing because you can get a lot more beef out of one cow, these animals are very prone to, uh, to bone and joint injuries. Um, to tearing these muscles because you get hypertrophy of the muscle fiber, but you really don't get an, a concomitant increase in the connective tissue of the muscles. This is why uh, people who bulk up and and they have all these big muscles tend to get injured a lot because you know they you spend a lot of time in the gym and then you really bulk up and you get these really massive hypertrophy of your muscle fibers but there's nothing that causes the connective tissue which supports it um, to increase in size as well um, these the beef that comes from these animals also is not quite as uh, uh, tasty as you would expect because they also don't uh, they don't develop the fat in it and you need a little bit of marbling in your steak um, at least for those of you carnivores out there uh, to get a nice tasty steak and these animals uh, just don't have that so what what seems like it might be a great idea on paper doesn't often work out in real life okay so this is double muscling myostatin deficiency and uh, Belgian blue cattle are uh, are affected. We did talk about uh, foot rot in the last lecture on the integument. Um, this one is a foot abscess. Obviously this animal has stepped on something that got up in between the toes and we have large abscessation and uh, it will generally drain out to the uh, bottom of the hoof or it may actually in this one also looks like it ruptured out at the top of the hoof. So this is a foot abscess and then the last one maybe the worst case of uh, uh, of uh, lam chronic laminitis that I've seen in cattle I didn't see this one let's just have the picture as you can tell it's quite old and uh, chronic laminitis and that's a it's an issue that's uh, incompletely understood in cattle often is uh, subsequent to uh, ruminal acidosis or a carbohydrate overload and it's not completely worked out just another uh, sequela of carbohydrate overload might better be in the, the uh, uh, nervous system but I put this one in here uh, this is a schwannoma of the brachial plexus we see this in cattle and occasionally in dogs more commonly than in other species and you can use the term peripheral nursery tumor or schwannoma or neurofibroma but brachial plexus is not an uncommon location for this rare tumor in cattle probably uh Okay, well that brings us to the, uh, the end of this particular lecture. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. I'm sorry that it took so long. Um, our next lecture was going to be on the nervous system of cattle. So I hope you'll join me again for that, and I hope everyone has a fantastic day.